Welcome or welcome back to Pairs Well with Knitting. I'm Jennifer, and this is a knitting podcast all about coupling my very favorite things together while on sabbatical of traveling and knitting. And let me tell you, we have had some heavy knitting adventures. We will be getting into all of our trip down east and focusing today on Maine, United States. Just to let you know, kind of a broad spectrum of how I'm going to be organizing today's podcast. We'll be talking about my finished objects while well on the road, starting or working on some other works in progress while we'll be, be bopping through um, the coastal regions of the beautiful east end of the US. Um, and then I'm going to get into some travel chit chat about things that I really enjoyed while we've been away with of course a tie-in of yarn shops and other fibery goodness that I've done and had the pleasure of experiencing um, and from that that's going to generate the acquisitions that I've been able to get my hands on and purchase well away at these local shops so let's do it um, first, I'm going to talk about what I'm wearing, and in today's podcast, is something a little different than I was hoping to wear today. However, um, I feel like it's very pairs well with knitting and pairs well with the weather. Uh, this is the Anchor Sweater by Petite Knit, a very famous designer and famous sweater, but looks a little different. Um, this version I knit up a couple years ago in the beginning of my knitting journey. And true to form to today, I did not use the recommended yarn, so did not have the recommended gauge. This yarn is Let Loppy by Istex, a very toothy, wiry, rustic Iceland uh, yarn that um, I think people really have a hard love for or not. I am an extreme lover, and this was my very first garment that I knit with it. Um, it's definitely softened up over time um, and it's just, I find with the age and with more wear, it's getting better all of the time. Um, because I knit this sweater, the Anchor sweater, in such a different yarn choice, um, obviously I had a very different gauge. And I'm just looking through my knitting journal uh, and from two years ago. I recalculated the entire sweater pattern with stitch counts. It took me at the time over more than three pages of calculations. Again, I was really new into knitting, um, but I guess I was always up for that challenge and really had my mindset on a sweater design that I was very interested in producing, coupled with the exact yarn. And nothing's changed. Um, I adore the sweater, I wear it often, and it is one of my very top picks while traveling because it's a neutral and very cozy. So let's talk about some of the finished objects that I've been able to knit on and finish while being away. So a lot of my knitting has happened in the car while we are going from place to place on short or long journeys, but as well, um, while I'm able to sit down and enjoy the beautiful view of the coast, um, quiet evenings in after we're going out for dinner in our room of wherever we're staying. And it's just been so nice to have that undivided time and quiet and experience knitting while I'm away. And of course, um, heavily embracing these moments um, while I'm creating or working on whatever it is I'm knitting, I feel with each stitch is bringing a piece of that memory along with me so that when I'm able to wear that finished garment, um, I have all those memories associated exactly where I was with smells and tastes. It's just my favorite thing. So first finished object is my Amy slipover. <laughs> this is something that I'll pop in a video like I did last time for my first episode of modeling the Amy slipover. Um, so the Amy slipover is a vest that was designed by Stanis Garn. It came in this gorgeous book 
that I was able to purchase in a local yarn shop in Toronto. And the original pattern and sample that they have produced is this beautiful monochromatic um, deep gray. As mentioned in my last podcast, um, monochromatic, often neutral tones were used in the Amy Slipover. And I was on a spring color kick. I really felt like my heart belonged with popsicles and ice cream and sorbets. And so I wanted kind of a melting version of fruit sorbet um, all over my slipover. Um, so it is a, I would call it almost like a high mock collar. You could fold down, but I think it looks fabulous up and stiff because it's knit at fairly fine gauge. Uh, you first knit the back of the garment and pick up your stitches to begin knitting the front. And it really looks like a bib. And I don't know if you got that from my video, but basically when you divide it, even here now when it's, when it's finished, it's literally like, like a bib. Um, you then pick up stitches to get this ribbon on the side. And this is actually what's used to tie and close the sides while you're wearing the slip over. And it is just the funnest. Um, I find I can just give it a little tie without even a knot to just hang there because obviously it's not going to blow off the body. Um, or I've also bowed it and it looks super cute. Um, I've really enjoyed wearing it with jeans and skirts. I've worn it with um, even shorts. And everywhere I go, people comment on it, which is the nicest because I don't know if I'd get the comments back home, but I find people out in the East are very commenty, which is so appreciated. And it also offers a little bit of an opener for chit chat, which is great. Um, this Amy Slipover, again, because of my different yarn choices and gauge, um, I had a different vision with sizing. So I did some recalculations and you may notice that in the video, the slipover is quite a bit smaller than the intended designer had wanted. Um, I wanted a little more form fitting and cropped. So just to give you an example without giving too much away, because obviously the pattern is purchased when you buy the book um, in the Stannis Garden Software Women book that I just showed, um, I cast on 30 less stitches um, for the back than recommended in the pattern. So overall, that made for a much smaller vest. And obviously some recalculations did have to happen to make the rest of the vest work, which it did. And it was just, it was super fun knit. Uh, the yarns, again, will be my show notes. Basically one um, ball of the Briggs & Little Sport Cream uh, was held throughout, was the one consistent, uh, except for the ribbing on the bottom and the side ties, which that was held double, two Briggs and Little Sport held double. Um, but each section here was with a different yarn. The raspberry color and apricot were two different yarns that I purchased last year while away in Austria. So those have really nice meaning for me. And the highlighter yellow is just a super fun sock yarn that I got at local yarn store in Toronto. Uh, that was the last one I believe that they had. So that's my Amy slipover. My next finished object is a little smaller and just making sure I didn't forget anything. This is the baby hue. Again, this is another design by Petite Knit. This is a very simple uh, top up construction uh, beanie or toque or hat. Uh, technically I'm in Canada now, so it does become a toque, although I did come from the States and filming about Maine, so we shall say beanie. Um, this was an only car knit. So this is still a little damp. I did do a wet block today, but because it's a little damp out, she hasn't dried yet. Hopefully I'll pop in a video as well to show. 
This is an, a gorgeous yarn by La Bienname. This is the Felix uh, yarn Hell Double in the colorway Hella, and it's hella fine. Um, this was a yarn that I picked up while my girlfriend from San Francisco, who's also a knitter, was in Toronto, and we decided to get matching yarn to produce a matching thing. So we picked the baby hue to share as a lovely memory and friendship together. So this was knit, like I said, only on car rides, which actually served as a great travel commute knit, if you will. Um, I cast it on while we were in a part of Nova Scotia, which we will get to later in another episode, and literally cast off as we were coming up I should say actually down so further south in Nova Scotia. So it was only a car knit, no cheating outside of the car. A super fun knit, a super quick knit, really simple decreases with SSKs and twos together. There's a little corner for you and it just creates a really pleasing little decrease curved top. It's a slouchy hat. It's gonna be fun to wear not super warm probably because it's only a single layer of fabric that's created however um because it doesn't have any kind of unique edging ribbing or um, eye cord it's just a stock net that's cast on and it naturally rolls up on itself as a stock net does so i'm debating on after it dries and gets all gorgeous um, to actually lift it up and um, tuck it under, stitch it up to just have a little folded brim to give it a really nice clean edge. We'll see once it's dry, what's gonna happen. That's the biggie hue. Moving on, I have a unique finished object to knitting because it's not knitting, but I just thought for fun, I would show my tie dye shirt that I made. Um, I don't know if I'll be modeling this one, but this is from Ben and Jerry's when we stopped through um, Vermont Stowe, which you'll be hearing about a smidge, even though it's not Maine. Um, they offered a, a table oh, just around the corner when you go into Ben and Jerry's um, that you can make your own tie-dye shirt. Now, if you know Ben and Jerry's, it's a very, North American big ice cream brand that I think pride themselves on whole um, whole ingredients, no, no ingredients that you can't pronounce per se. Um, so they're in Stowe. Uh, it's very wholesome looking when you drive up. They have cows out front and all kinds of, you know, gorgeous Stowe mountains around. Uh, so we, on a very hot day, went and had ice cream first. As we went down um, to go enjoy our ice cream on one of the picnic tables, of course my eyes spotted to the left a table of make your own tie-dye shirts. Ben & Jerry's is known for tie-dye shirts that you can buy. They're already pre-made and, you know, professionally done. Uh, however, they let you prepare your own, which I thought was such delight. And they were $7 less than the pre-made ones. So that was pretty fun. Um, I worked with the Ben & Jerry's team, the tie-dye team, in creating this fun design of a little spiral tie-dye. And I've got to say, this is my first tie-dye piece since I was a kid when we did it back in the backyard. It was a good one. It was fun. And just like a little memory. That's my Ben & Jerry's tie-dye shirt. All right, we are now going to talk about the works in progress I have. So we will start with the sweater with the yarn that I showed in my first episode, which was the Istex, um, another Icelandic yarn. This is the Unspun Plutolopi that I received as a gift from a girlfriend, my knitting girlfriend that doesn't like rustic yarn. Um, so she offered it up to me and I said, of course, how, how lucky am I? She gave me four plates of this very dark, I'd say a dark 
gray, possibly a light heathered black. I still am not 100% sure of what the colorway is. Um, so I started the Snowy Forest, um, Snowy Forest sweater by Midori Hirose. This pattern I have from my Lina magazine. This is a 2020, winter 2020 is old, a uh, winter 2020 magazine. Uh, in this, I've started doing the gorgeous cables. And this is my first cable sweater. I've done cables and hats before, but never in a garment. Uh, this is uh, a yoke of cables. And then after the yoke, I think after you split for sleeves, then it's a stock net body and sleeves after. This has been such a fun little sit and knit. Uh, it is suggested that this is like a beginner friendly uh, cable pattern for sweaters. And I, I think it would be. They, Midori Hirose has prepared the pattern with written instructions that are very detailed. Uh, she's also had a whole like glossary of terms that help you figure out how to do the different cables or stitches. As well, she has a chart and charts are my preferred method of reading knit patterns. So I've gone by the chart, which is great. Um, this is basically uh, increased uh, cables as you come down this big guy here. It's little, there we go. Ooh, that's good with the lighting. Um, with a little like one by one cable, two times that are beside. Uh, the modification I've already started with just because I find, again, Lucy Goosey Knitter and I'm knitting on a US 8. I believe the recommended needle is a US 10. This is two strands of the Pluto Lopi by Istex. Is that um, I haven't done the increases recommended on the one by one cable. I don't need it, it's wide enough already. And I may be running out of yarn a little quicker than expected. I have this much left to hopefully get through the yoke and part of the body. I have two plates left to get through the entire rest of the sweater plus the neckband. I never knit the neckband because from what I saw about the postings of this beautiful sweater, and it is true for me as well, that because of the quantity of cast on stitches that are done and the immediate rapid increases to fit um, this pattern repeats, the neck is quite wide. So I thought I would try to outsmart the system a bit. I omitted the neckband completely and just cast on after what would be the neckband. I would like to do a double band to bend it over, fold it over, and stitch it down. I don't know if that's gonna be in the cards for me, and I'm also debating trying to purchase and potentially match the existing Plutolopi color I have, just so I have enough yarn to do long sleeves. If not, I'm highly considering a short sleeve, almost slipover version, that I think could still look beautiful. It could be very cozy. You'll see if it gets short sleeves or long sleeves, time will tell. That is the Snowy Forest sweater by Midori Hirose. So much fun cabling. My next whip is something that I hadn't even started before I left because this yarn, and I will kind of work a little backwards here, was the yarn that I was really just about that I purchased in Maine. I'll get into more of the details about the yarn in my acquisition since this is new to me. Um, but this is in a beautiful, and of course I have little bits and bobs in the yarn. Um, this is a beautiful, very rustic, farmy, extremely uh, sheepy wool that I purchased in Maine on one of my yarn journeys. Um, with it, I had started knitting the Felix pullover, and this is my second Felix pullover that I've done. Felix pullover is worked top down with one 
just one layer of uh, one by one ribbing. It's worked almost like a raglan, but instead of just normal raglan increases, we've got little eyelets that are created. This is very challenging to see with the dark of everything. It might not show up that well on camera, kind of, sort of. They create this gorgeous little eyelet V and it's a continuous version of these that go down in the sweater along the raglan line. Um, I've done the size two for this which is a little larger than my first one that I did in a Topsy Farm yarn, um, where I knit the size one, but I felt like this needed to be a little looser and baggier and boxier. So we'll see how it turns out. Um, and I'm going to hold off on the details about the yarn. I will share the name of the yarn in this section of the video. And this is the Sheep's Natural by Dornyard Yarns in the sheep's black. Can't wait to talk about it. My last whip, which I feel is slightly unfair to even show, however, trying to be a good knit citizen um, is, and I brought with me, is my Shetland Wool Week uh, Bugger Floor Beanie. Uh, this has had no time on it. I have been completely sidetracked with all of my other projects, new cast-ons, this will get time, it's just not for now. Uh, and I know the reason why I haven't had time, I haven't made time to knit on this gorgeous beanie is because it is so big. So I find when things are not working out as I had hoped or planned, um, that they they get some some session alone. They get some little like downtime to chill. And that when I have the headspace again, or heart to go back, I can either replan, recalculate, or continue to knit and kind of see what happens, which I think I might do. Um, but it will come. All um, gorgeous shut and wool. And I won't get into the details because I did with my last episode. Okay, that is my whips for now. So I'm going to do something a little different. Um, slightly outside of knitting podcast world. Um, I'm going to be discussing a bit of the travel adventures that we've had and insert some videos. Um, and then I'm going to get into the fibery goodness and new acquisitions that I've purchased well on my time away in Maine. We have had just the best time, uh, varying weather, but have really made the most of everything that Maine has to offer. So I'll put in clips here and I'll share about all of that. Enjoy. To begin our road trip down east from Toronto, we went through Vermont and through to Maine. In Vermont, we had a couple stops outside of the Ben and Jerry's Ice Creamery, and we stopped on probably which was almost the hottest day of our trip at Shelburne Farms, which is located in Shelburne, Vermont. It's an education nonprofit farm that spans for acres. Um, you get onto a wagon that's pulled by a tractor and a lovely person of the Shelburne Farm community, and it brings you up to the barns. Um, the barns, and I believe the layout, was designed by Frederick Olmsted, who is also the designer behind um, very big uh, famous parks of the US that include Central Park in New York. The barns are stunning. Um, and on this farm, uh, Shelburne Farms, there is livestock that include cow, goat, sheep, rooster. And um, because it is an educational farm, they do have livestock that you can see in the groups or herds of animals. But as well in the barn, they have um, individual animals that you can learn about from one of the educators there, um, pet, and it is just, it's so lovely because you get to interact not only with the people at the farm that are really knowledgeable and experienced about the animals and the culture there, um, learn about what is produced as well by the farm. That includes cheddar cheese. Uh, they have a cheesery in K 
Canada, I feel like it's, you know, fromagerie, um, where they make and prepare their own gorgeous cheese, cheddar cheese. Sadly, because this was the beginning of our trip, we did not purchase the cheese, we were sampling the cheese. Although they do say that they ship the cheese out uh, through mail, and because it's all vacuum packed, it, it lasts. Uh, Shelburne Farms was amazing. It was a gorgeous place. It was in our first time there, and it did not disappoint with talking to the staff and learning even more um, about all the animals and what they do on this gorgeous farm. Uh, that was Shelburne Farms. Next up, we went to the McLoon's Lobster Shack. This is a lobster shack or cabin that is located just at the lobster fishery um, of Maine. And this one was located in South Tom Thomason, Maine. Um, we had driven from Vermont through to this area after Freeport and Camden. And we were greeted with the smells of the ocean as soon as we started driving in. Now these lobster shacks that we've had some experience doing uh, on other trips down east um, are very rustic. You drive through what seems like very cottage country-esque um, to get to the ocean and once you're there, you know, the smell of the ocean wafting up through the nostrils is just such a welcome sign and to us such a summer vacation smell. Um, lovely. So we went into this lobster shack area and um, it, we were not the only ones that knew about the McLoon's lobster shack. Many people were there. Lobster had just been caught fresh, um, of course, I'm sure moments before um, of that day. And there is a very concise menu uh, that include lobster and other bountiful, delicious items from the sea and beyond. Um, we had a lobster each that are accompanied by the very traditional um, parts of a lobster meal with coleslaw bits and um, little Cape Cod chips, which are super fun. Um, they do offer beverages, but if you would like to BYOB, it is fully encouraged. They do not uh, sell, as most lobster shacks I do not think do, uh, their own alcoholic beverages. So there were families that were very well prepared, far beyond what we were, with a beautiful bottle of Chardonnay or a um, little can of beer. Uh, we just had some water and that was fine for us. So we fully enjoyed our lobster dinner as kind of the gateway into our down east experience of the beautiful bounties from the ocean. Um, the lobster meat was just so fresh and supple, uh, sweet. Um, and the nice thing was is that we got to compare between the main lobster and lobster from Canada. We found that this lobster meat in general was sweeter and more delicate than our lobster to the north of our motherland. Um, and the shell was a little more delicate. We were able to pull it apart more with our hands and not have to rely on the crackers, which was interesting. Good little comparison experiment there. Um, so the lobster shack was great. Uh, for desserts, they offer different pies that include a whoopie pie, which Maine seem to really enjoy having on their menus. We had had, or I had had, a whoopie pie in Freeport right before coming. So did not need a second whoopie, whoopie pie of the day. And if you don't know what a whoopie pie is, it is basically two pieces of cake, often chocolate, where they have an icing center. So it's, it's almost a sandwich of um, a chocolate cake piece, icing, and a chocolate cake chunk. Um, they can vary in size, and these ones that they had were not tiny very um, robust in size. After all of the lobster we consumed, we did not need the whoopie pie, but really enjoyed our time there. Families were having a great time with each other, and I think it was such a fun experience for everyone to have had time at the McLoon's Lobster Shack. Moving on to our last location um, was the Jordan's Pond House. 
This is um, a restaurant that is located in the Acadia National Park, just outside of Bar Harbor, Maine. This is a location that is very drivable from the ferry uh, that goes from Bar Harbor, Maine to Yarmouth in Nova Scotia. Um, this is a beautiful national park. Um, forests and trails where you can go biking and hiking along. Um, for us, because we did have a ferry to catch, we were on a bit of a time constraint, um, but still loud enough time for all the delicious things that Jordan's Pond House has to offer. So we winded through the trail uh, with our car, uh, driving into our parking lot. And then once we got out, we walked around Jordan's Pond. It's a beautiful pond with mountains in the background. Um, hopefully the footage captures the beautiful vista that we were able to enjoy. Um, lots of fun critters that were flying overhead that were bouncing around in the pond. Um, and when we got our table at the pond house, um, this was our second time there. Uh, we had been on a trip down east before. Uh, it definitely didn't disappoint. It was very comparable with our first experience. Um, but this time we had sunshine, last time we had rain. Um, we had sat outside overlooking the pond, which I feel was the best view of the restaurant. We got there pretty much at the opening because you can make reservations before. Um, we made a reservation that day and we're in line to have a reservation made for us and got right in, which was great. And we enjoyed their popovers. Uh, the popovers, if you are not knowing what this is, this is almost like a Yorkshire pudding American style. It is a uh, very creamy, um, pulled apart kind of bun, very rich um, but delicate. On the outside, the exterior is crusty and crisp. Um, it definitely puffs up with the heat, the high temperatures, I'm sure, that it's baked at and it is just a delight. Um, they serve these popovers with butter and fresh strawberry jam that they've made. Um, you pair it with a pot of tea on the side and your afternoon is just glowing with the pond in the background. We enjoyed many a popover uh, with some tea and it was lovely. That was the Jordan's Pond House. I hope you got to enjoy some of the content that I shared about our main adventures that may or may not have included some knitting and yarn. Um, now I do want to get into more of the heavy set of knitting to finish off today's podcast with acquisitions that I was able to purchase well away. Um, and I'm going to have this directed by the yarn shops that I was able to visit. The first is the Mother of Pearl Yarn Shop. This is located in Freeport, Maine, just off the main drag. And if you know Freeport, Maine in that main drag section, it's a lot of big box stores. And interestingly, I don't even think a yarn shop would really fit in with that aesthetic there. If you go a little further down the road, you're gonna come across the mother of pearl. And it is such a pearl and a delight to be there. Um, this store I spoke with the lovely ladies that worked there and they were just so kind with their time and sharing answers to all of my questions. They carry obviously a variety of beautiful yarns from near and far. They had beautiful shop samples as well. Um, but of course, I'm always into the local yarn, I'm into the rustic yarn, and items that I would either have a difficult time getting my hands on back home or new to me. At first, I was greeted with the ladies to ask if I was participating in the yarn cruise. And I thought, yarn cruise? This sounds like a dream. Being on the water, knitting with other fellow knitters in Maine on a boat, Yes, please. But I said to the lady, sadly, I was only there for the day and we were driving through to our next stop in Maine. And the ladies giggled and they said, no, no, it's not an actual cruise on a boat. It's a cruise from shop to shop. They told me about it. It's the best idea. 
a bunch of these main yarn shops have collaborated together to create what they call this annual yarn cruise where knitters and fiber enthusiasts alike get to venture from yarn shop to yarn shop starts in about june ends in about october where you get stamps on your yarn passport your yarn cruise passport um, all with not only the enjoyment of visiting the different shops and um, i think experiencing new shops for the first time hopefully for people um, but you're entered in draws, there's a net along, all kinds of great things. Um, when you purchase the Yarn Cruise Pass or Passport, it comes with a little project bag and a little bit of goodies. So I did not purchase one because I wasn't visiting a fraction of the gorgeous shops, sadly in Maine, just because of time. Um, but if I were in Maine for longer, I definitely would. How fun is that? Um, what I did purchase in the Mother of Pearl Yarn Shop was this gorgeous beast. This is a Peace Fleece U.S. and Maine spun and produced American wool. This is a worsted weight, extremely shapey, which is my sheer delight. This is in Arctic White and um, this is a combination of a remboule and fine wool, uh, and then a 25% mohair. Comes in 200 yards, it's 113 grams, which seems pretty standard for wool out in the east area, which I've been seeing, and it's just a delight. It definitely veers away from, I would call it off rustic. Um, I'm thinking of like wines when they're off dry, they're, they're a hint of sweet. This would be off rustic to me. It is a yarn that I think tries to pretend it's more rustic than it's not, um, but it is gorgeously soft. And I don't know because so many things happen to be cream in this room, but there is just a little halo without even blocking for the yarn to bloom up already. Um, I'm so excited to knit with this that I have already balled it up on my uh, portable Swift that was in my last travel video. And I produced just a mini little swatch of a lace pattern repeat. Uh, this pattern, <laughs> this is from a lace chart that is uh, from Sari Nordland. This is super not a worsted weight chart or sweater, but this was her kutar. I loved the, the lace work so much and I just thought how fun would it be in a worsted. So I gave it a little go while I was at a cafe in Maine. I had so much fun knitting it. It was my first time doing this pattern, but it happens to be in my library that I purchased a while ago and I do love it haven't started on this actual project yet because this i think is going to take up a lot of math brain space for me to recalculate but that might be the plan like how gorge are we that is the peace fleece worsted that i purchased at the mother of pearl i had a great time there and thank you to those ladies my next shop that i hit and just a delight was in Camden, Maine. This shop is called the Cashmere Goat. Also interestingly, off the main drag of Camden, Camden is a beautiful, I would say village, town. They may say city, I'm not sure. Um, in Maine on a harbor. And again, everything is just so beautifully done, designed with the ocean, the smell, People are so friendly and such a delight. Um, it, it was just so nice being there. We were there for about four days. I could have definitely spent much more time there. The cashmere goat was lovely and very warm to be in. I was greeted immediately by Kristen, who happens to be the owner and just a fiber enthusiast. She was very excited to share all about the things that she carries, um, shop samples, uh, details about yarn. She was very knowledgeable about everything that she carried, which was amazing because I love getting more information. 
Um, so it was super nice to meet her, to walk around the shop. Um, again, they carry yarns of obviously that I'm familiar with, some that I have never seen before. Um, a lot of interesting uh, like rustic yarns from the UK, but of course I gravitated to the local main yarns. Um, I just want to say that they had beautiful samples, different kits that were prepared. They even had kits that were made by a main knitwear designer. Um, and I don't want to get the name wrong. It was called Mrs. Knitter's Designs. These were beanies, or we would call them in Canada, toques, uh, that were designed with fingering weight wool. And my favorite one was one with a lobster on it. How great for a Maine designer with yarn and really depicting Maine with a lobster. What I did purchase was not lobstery at all, but this is the yarn that I'm knitting my Felix Pullover with by Amy Christoffers. Uh, this is a yarn that I was immediately drawn to. It doesn't even have a yarn label or ball band, which made it even more exciting for me, I think, to pick up, sniff, squish, and ask questions about. Um, this yarn is a very rustic, very sheepy yarn from a farm that was apparently close by in Lincolnville from Camden, which was called the Dorn Yard Yarn. Um, and again, I went on to the website to try to find more information about this yarn from the farm and I couldn't find anything. <clears throat> about the wool that they're producing or I guess having milled for them. Um, I do know that there is more of this gorgeous yarn back at the shop at the Cashmere Goat, which I may be ordering from Canada because it's that fabulous. This is the Sheep's, what was it called? The Sheep's Natural Black. They had two colorways. This is a natural black off of a black sheep. Um, they had another um, color that was the natural cream of the sheep. Um, apparently, originally they had had four colorways that also included two different kind of gray or maybe a brown tone of natural sheep, so no extra dye was used. And it is just a delight. There's a lot of almost pushback with the yarn. It's in, I believe, what would be a worsted weight. And it is, there's like a heavy, creamy, almost greasy factor with the yarn, where where I'm working with it on the Felix is, I'm careful not to touch my face, so I, I don't react hopefully on my face with it. I wash my hands right away because I feel like not only is it very full of lanolin, but perhaps um, spinning oils as well, which is pretty cool and it smells amazing. Um, so I believe that with after blocking this yarn with my Felix, it's going to do all of the fabulous things that we love as knitters. I think it's gonna bloom, I think it's gonna drape, I think those spinning oils are going to wash off of it and it's just going to soften up with wash and wear over time. So this was my very favorite find in Maine and this is the Dorn, Door Yard Yarn um, from Dorn Yard Farm, purchased at the Cashmere Goat. There we are. So, I think with that being said, um, I want to thank all of the people that I came across on the leg of Down East in Maine from the shop owners that I was able to meet and graciously have time spent with me to answer all my questions and chat with to the people that work in the stores that are the fiber artists themselves, other knitters that I met on the sidewalks and chatted with. I had such a delightful time. Um, so thank you. I also want to thank you for tuning in today and watching this episode. Um, I do want to say that if you find yourself traveling, that I would highly suggest to get yourself into a local yarn shop, talk to other fiber enthusiasts and find out where they knit, what they do. This is what I did and I've, I've had a great time. So. Thank you very much. I hope you get some joy and find joy in your knitting today, and we'll see you soon.